Thank you for listening to this message from O'Fallon Assembly of God. It's our goal to love God passionately, live life abundantly, and lead people purposefully. We pray that God uses this message to help you do the same. Thank you, Pastor Tony. And the reason it seems like seven months, it's actually been about 14 months, but we were gone for six months preaching in other churches. And, and so, um, you know, that, that happens. Um, you know, recently I was in another church and, and there was a plaque on the wall uh, dedicated to the service men and women of the armed forces that have passed away, that have died you know, due to the different wars and conflicts that we've some had over the years. And there was a, a grandmother there with her seven-year-old grandson. And the grandson looks up and he points at that plaque. And he says, what's that, Grandma? And she says, well, that's the men and women who have died in the service. And he thought about that for a second. He said, is that the morning service or the evening service? <laughs> yeah. Um I, you know, I realize sometimes pastors have a tendency to preach for a long time. And I, I'm going to try to preach long enough, but quit before you all fall asleep, okay? And, and if I do that, I guess I, I'd be fairly successful in what I'm going to bring. Um, you know, somebody could ask you, what time is it? And, 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 and you'll immediately look at your wall what time it is. But I want to talk about time today for a different, in, in a different respect. What time is it in the history of the church? What time is it in the history of our lives? What time is it in the history of America? And that would be my first question. What time is it? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 Verses 1 through 8 says, there's a time for everything, right? Oh, I guess it's time for me to preach that type of a message. Now, I will tell you that some of you will probably leave here today and say, I didn't like what he preached. And that's okay. I can live with that. Because I know that what I'm going to preach is in the Bible. And that leads me to the second question that I'm going to ask you today. Have you ever been deceived? Have you ever been deceived? Now, by a newspaper headline, by a television ad, by a friend, how about a car salesman? How about, or an insurance salesman? You know? Have you ever been deceived? I've been deceived. Boy, I love to watch TV commercials. And in, in TV commercials, it says, but wait, not just one, you get two. Call now, get on the internet, go to blah, blah, blah.com, and we'll send you a second one for just shipping and handling. <laughs> and shipping and handling is $24.99 for the item that you ordered that was $4.99. You know, yeah. I've been deceived. And I think all of us, have probably been deceived. But if your house was burning down, would you want me to deceive you by simply saying, "Eh, it's just a small fire. It's only in the kitchen, you know? Would you want me to, to let you be deceived if you had a flat tire? And I say, well, it's only flat on one side. And it's only one out of four. That's 25% okay. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want me to deceive you. And I won't. And you wouldn't want me to do it without passion. If your house was on fire, I hope you'd expect me to run in and tell you the house is on fire, not simply say, well, I'll text them later on and see if they get a text, or, you know, I'll I'll send them an email or something. No, do it with passion. And so I want you to know that this morning, as I speak, I, I will speak with passion. Not without love, but with passion. And the reason that I do speak with passion is because I love. 
Some of the subject matter this morning, some of the things that I'm going to bring up about deception, I have asked for two weeks now that the Holy Spirit would convict you if you've been deceived. And if there is any deception in that, that, that you will recognize it today. So it is the work of the Holy Spirit that I'm hoping will take place this morning in our lives to show us where deception might be. I know that you care about being deceived. And I know that your reaction to being deceived is probably one of, I'm not going to let that happen to me again. And that's good, but we need to know how to do it. Now, you realize there's a lot of deception in the Bible, right? The first, it starts out right in Genesis. Adam and Eve. Eve says that uh, um, the serpent deceived me and I ate. What did the serpent use to deceive her? Words and half-truths. Words and half-truths. And you're getting a lot of that in your life today. If you watch TV, if you read the newspaper, if you go on the internet, uh, if you listen to friends who are under peer pressure, you're getting a lot of words and half-truths. In the story of Samson and Delilah, you remember the deception there? Uh, Rahab, when she was hiding the spies, she deceived the king's police. Abraham deceived uh, the king when he told him that Sarah was a brother and not his wife. There's lots of deception examples in the Bible. Matthew 24, 4 says, Watch out that no one deceive you. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Do not deceive yourselves. Leviticus says, Do not deceive one another. Ephesians says, Do not let no one deceive you with empty words. Matthew 24, 24 says, In the last days even the elect will be deceived if that's possible. But here's my main text for today. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. Now, I want you to replace that. Whatsoever a man soweth to a nation. Whatever a nation sows, so shall it also reap. And if, if our nation is sowing deception upon us, we'll reap a whirlwind of deception. How does it happen? How does deception come about? Well, I gave you a hint. Part of it is with half-truths and with words in most cases. Deception also happens like the dust accumulates in your house and my office. The other day, I'm looking around my office, and my office looked pretty good. Not my office at home, but my office at work. And, and, and I picked up something. And all of a sudden, here was a clean spot on top of my filing cabinet where that item that I picked up. And, and, and I saw just how clean the filing cabinet could be on top, but it was covered with dust the rest of the places. That didn't happen overnight. That happened over a long period of time. And it happened without me even noticing it for the most part. It happened just as day by day by day goes on. And until I removed something or I wiped my finger across it, did I recognize just how dusty my filing cabinet was. Now, my wife probably thinks I didn't do anything about it, but I actually went and got a rag and dusted the top of my filing cabinet off. I didn't leave it that way. I made a correction. And that's the great thing about life, is when we've been deceived, when we recognize the truth, 
we can wipe away the dust and we can start fresh again. We can start fresh with the, with the new truth that we have. The truth being the truth. Some of the examples of, well, some of the words that are used to deceive us, and, and these are obvious, and I don't want you to think I'm being political, but politics uses, changes a lot of words on us. Um, instead of illegal alien, it became illegal immigrants. And then it went from illegal immigrants to undocumented workers. You know, um, though radical Islam went from radical Islam to freedom fighters in our textbooks now. So our kids are, are reading that those who flew into the World Trade Towers in 2001, they weren't, they weren't terrorists, they were freedom fighters. Deception at work. With hate speech now means that anything you disagree with somebody else on becomes hate speech. Gay used to mean happy. Government funded now taxpayer funded is what it really is, not government funded because you are the ones paying into it. Cheating. Cheating, 71% of college students today cheat on exams. And you know what they say? They say it's okay as long as they don't get caught. They're being deceived. I mean, the whole idea of an exam is to find out what you've learned so that when you go out into the workplace, you're able to competently perform those things. Pornography. Pornography, since it was made legal, Bill McCartney, the president of Promise Keepers, says there's an epidemic of men addicted to pornography in our churches today. And that's not just Bill McCartney saying that. That is study after study after study, survey after survey after survey says there are men in our churches addicted to pornography. And you know why? Because it's readily available at home, at the office, everywhere. With the new stands you go by. Abortion, legalized in 1973, is not what pleases God by any means. When I said Whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. Or whatever a nation sows, so shall it reap. You know, you all here, and, and many of you can, can, can assimilate to this, the fact that Social Security is going broke, right? What do you think had happened to Social Security if those 40 million babies were in the workforce today? We wouldn't be talking about government going broke. We wouldn't be talking about Social Security going broke if those 40 million babies were still alive. Booker T. Washington says, A lie doesn't become a truth, a wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. And yet, we have agendas being forced down our throat. We have agendas that are, that, are, that are being forced upon us whether we want them or not. When we have textbooks and kindergarten and, and first graders being taught through, from a book called, called Johnny Has Two Mommies or Johnny Has Two Daddies, they're forcing it upon a younger generation and and, and the church is only one generation away from disappearing. Deception. People are being deceived every day. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't love those that are deceiving us. It doesn't mean that we don't try to convince them and, and save them from fire. But it means that there are a lot of people being deceived. I remember when, when, when President Obama, years ago, he wouldn't take a stand on an issue. And 
after about four years in office or three or four years in office, all of a sudden he took a stand. And when they asked him why he, he took a stand now, he says, well, my daughter convinced me of this stand. The younger generation has a lot of love in its heart, but it's also being deceived in many, many ways. And we've got to recognize that. There comes a time within the church, within society, within a nation, there comes a time when we must recognize deception has hit us, we must stand up, and we must speak up. Now, don't do it by screaming and yelling from the pulpit. I get to do that because you guys are all here, you know. I know I'm preaching to the choir, you know. But, but at some point in time, I beg you, when your friends or when a conversation is taking place that is not in line with the things of God, Stop. Stand up. Interject that pro-choice does not mean that a woman has the right to do anything with her own body. When premarital sex is brought up and it says, oh, it's okay because Hannah, what's her name? Um, Hannah Brown. Hi, Jim Brown. I know, not related to you. (laughs) Some of you probably watched The Bachelorette, and and I'm going to be honest with you, I've never seen it, but let me tell you this. Here's what I read this week. Bachelorette star Hannah Brown has been open about her Christian faith this past season. She is off off deal openly boasted about premarital sex as it was no big deal. Brown later spoke with Entertainment Tonight about her religious views on Christ, which boiled down to a personal relationship with Jesus without doctrinal accountability. Listen to this. Here's what she said. Regardless of anything that I've done, well, people might think, oh, that deserves a scarlet letter. That's not how it works. I can do whatever I want. I sin daily, and Jesus still loves me. It's all washed, and if the Lord doesn't judge me, it's all forgiven. Then no man or woman can judge me either. Do you see the half-truths in there? Absolutely, Jesus loves her. Absolutely. Absolutely, she sins every day. We all do. But Jesus does judge us. Someday, every single one of us is going to stand before the Lord and give an account for every word and every deed. Yeah. And it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Half-truths. Yes, our sins are going to be washed away. There's no doubt about it. But there also comes, it says, if you sin, you repent. And, if you, and it says that if you're a, a new creature in Christ, you don't go on sinning just because grace abounds. You don't sin more so that grace abounds more. You recognize the fact that there is sin there. And you repent of it. And you turn. We cannot live by our own standards. We must live by the standards that are spelled out right here in God's Word. There is no other instruction manual to live the type of life that God would have us to, to live 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the deceiver, Satan, prowls around like a lion seeking who he might devour. Galatians 5, 
16 through 22, says, live by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, and you won't be deceived. Proverbs is full of things about get wisdom, get discernment. And that's what we need today. We need a spirit of discernment in our lives that we are able to discern what is absolutely true, the standard of God, and what the world would have us to have. There's a story in Joshua chapter 9 where God had told Joshua when he crossed over into the land of milk and honey, he said, drive out all the vites, the parasites, the Jebusites, the Havites, the, you know, all of the ites, not the gigabytes and not the terabytes, but, but the rest of them. Drive them out. Don't make a compromise with them. Well, in, in chapter 9, there was a group of Gibeons that came through and they deceived Joshua into making a compromise, a, a covenant with them. And they did it by wearing old shoes and carrying old bread that was moldy and all that. You can read this for yourself. And it says in verse 13, I think it is, that he says, and, and Joshua made a covenant with them. After they tasted their bread. Verse 14, though, says, but they did not inquire of God. Now, they're stuck in a covenant with these people. And they can't break their word. Because that's just as bad. I mean, if we say our yes is not our yes and our no is not our no, then, then, then you know, we're no better than the rest of the world. If we make an agreement, we've got to stick with that agreement. If we say yes, our yes has to be yes. Our no has to be no. Well, <coughs> excuse me. We have to inquire of God. We need a wisdom and a spirit of discernment that much of the world today doesn't have. Pastor on Wednesday talked about eight and a half million Mormons who are deceived into believing they are an Orthodox Christianity. There are another 6.2 Jehovah Witnesses who have been deceived into believing they are Christians. Even though their beliefs on sin and who Jesus is are totally off base. Many of you may know who Oprah Winfrey is. And Oprah Winfrey has gotten into the theological business over the years. And I can tell you, if you listen to her and you believe what she says, you have been deceived tremendously. Her doctrine will send you to hell. It's that simple. We have to have the eyes of our hearts open. You know, I love that song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Without the eyes of our hearts being open, we can be deceived too easily. It's that simple. Matthew 24, 11 says, And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, The Spirit clearly says that in the last time, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. doesn't say they all leave the church. There are going to be ones that are deceived that are still going to be in the church. The wheats and the tares, you know, um, that story. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, In the last days, Christians will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Luke 17.26-30 says, Just as in the days of Noah, eating and drinking and marrying, being given in marriage, up to the day where Noah entered the ark. I'll tell you, with all the rain we've had recently, I wondered, I wondered if the ark was going to float past my place, you know. I'd see the doors closed, but, you know. Same as in the days of Lot. People were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, and building. 
We allow our taxpayer dollars to pay for condom distribution in our song. And even in our prisons. And that's plain wrong. But what are we doing about it as a church? Sex changes are being paid for with taxpayer dollars, with your dollars. What are we doing about it? Do we think there will be no consequences? If we do, we're being deceived. Unfortunately, the Christian community has failed its civil obligation. 30 to 40 million Christians didn't vote in the last election. 30 to 40 million. That's a lot of votes. Today, let me tell you that, that you know, the, the scripture, you know, where God formed government, and he says, render unto Caesar's what's Caesar's, render unto God's what's God's. I mean, we have an obligation to vote. And let me tell you, without any hesitancy and with as much passion as I can muster, if you're not registered to vote, you need to get registered tomorrow. It's easy. Driver's license station, courthouse, you can register just about anyway nowadays in Illinois. Get registered to vote and then vote. Now, I'm going to trust that you as Christians understand who to vote for because you've listened to what they've had to say. And when you listen to what they have to say, you'll know who to vote for. There's no doubt in my mind. You remember Pharaoh said, kill the babies so Moses couldn't be found. You remember King Herod? He said, kill the babies so Jesus couldn't be found. Well, there's a faction out there in the United States government today that says, kill the babies. It's not what God wants. And it's time for us to stand up and speak up, to vote for those who who believe in the sanctity of life. I heard one, one guy the other day, I, I heard one leader saying something about, you know, that, that what's happening down at the border in Texas and that, that kids are being caged and so on and so forth. And, and, and she's saying, we have to come to a point that all lives matter, even the immigrants, the illegal immigrants, all lives matter. And I was just waiting. Come on. Some newspaper person, some reporter, ask her, well, doesn't that apply to the unborn in the womb of a mother too? They don't have the guts to stand up and ask that question. The deception breeds compromise. Compromise leads to disobedience, and disobedience leads to spiritual defeat. There's a man that I have a high respect for, Billy Graham. Billy Graham said he believes that 90% of Christians today live spiritually defeated lives because of compromise. They got one foot in the church and one foot in the world. They'll go along with whatever the belief is with whomever they're with. At that particular time. And, it, and, and, and there is no set standard like the word of God. America's at two wars right now. We're at, at war with, with radical Islam and their beliefs. And we're at war with our own country for the soul of America. Thursday. We celebrate 243 years that this country signed its independence. I wear a a patriotic tie today, uh, and I salute every one of you who have served in the military. 
because you offered up your life for this country and for the freedom, just as our founders did. And now it's time for this church to offer up its life as well for the freedom that Christ has granted us by standing up and speaking up and doing what we need to do. There are people in church today that think just because you're here, you're a Christian. They've been deceived to believe that by cheap grace. There are people who think they are Christian simply because they compare themselves against the other people at work who say they're Christian and say, well, I'm not as bad as them. I'm better than he is. I mean, look at he does. He says this and he goes to church and he thinks he's a Christian. Well, I don't do that. So I must be a Christian. Do we love them enough to tell them that that may not be true? There are people who have been deceived to believe that the Bible is old and that it's constantly evolving. And things that were a sin in the Old Testament aren't a sin in the New Testament. Jesus took all that away. Now, sin has always been sin from day one. And it will continue to be. There are people who who don't believe in the Holocaust. There are people in government today who have no idea what happened in the, in the late 30s and 40s and all the Jews that were, that were killed, the 6 million Jews that were killed. There are people who, who, who don't believe in a lot of different things that are being deceived in ways simply because nobody loves them enough to speak up and talk to them and have a and, and, and in a lot of cases I will admit they won't have an honest conversation with you they just want to scream and yell at you it's if they speak louder or if they call you names and and believe it or not I have I have relatives who call me names and say things about me simply because of my stance for life on the, on the issue of abortion. And they call themselves highly. When I, with master's degrees and all this, and, and, and yet when I start talking about the, the facts of abortion and, uh, and the arguments for, against abortion, they start calling me names. And when that doesn't work, they call me names louder. You know, the objection, the objective is to shut me down, to quiet me up so that I don't say anything. And that is happening in your lives as well. There are people who are calling you names, saying things about you so that you'll shut up. Don't let it work. Don't let it work. So what do we do now? We need to inquire of the Lord. I said, what time is it? Was my first question. I'll ask it again. What time is it? It's time for me to shut up. And it's time for the Holy Spirit to go to work. Pastor Tony, if you would come. If our prayer partners would come and make yourselves available to pray with anyone that that wants to come forth. And, and our prayer partners this morning are, are available for you if you need healing in your body, your finance, your spiritual life, anything else. But, but I'm going to ask this. Has this message spoken to you at all? Have you recognized that you're being deceived in some area of life? Have you recognized that you failed to stand up and speak up? And if so, are you willing to do something about that? Are you willing to ask for wisdom and a spirit of discernment on how to battle that? And and if so, 
come forward. Come pray with one of our brothers. Come pray that God would give you a discernment on how to approach that in life with people. There were three three Supreme Court decisions that have led to our deception. One in 1962 when they took voluntary prayer out of schools. One took place in 1973 when they legalized abortion. And the most recent one took place June 15th, just four years ago. And that was when the Supreme Court redefined the definition of marriage as no longer being between a man and a woman. Are we willing to stand up and speak up to change that within our community? I ask you if you're you're willing to do that, come forward, pray with our brothers.